Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Teresa Grolinski, and I'm the Executive Director of Events and Thought Leadership here at Hightower. We truly value our industry partners, and our Hightower advisors work really closely with CPAs to provide our clients with those holistic financial plans that really look at every aspect of their financial wealth and what it is that they're going to be leaving to the next generation. Um, and so that's why we're so pleased today to offer this webinar, Family Wealth Planning, Preparing the Next Generation with John Nersessian. Um, I think many of you may have um, seen a presentation from him before. We're so lucky to have him do this with us personally. He is head of advisor education at PIMCO. And hi, John. Hi, Teresa. Thanks for having me. So happy to. So John's here today. He's going to help us do a couple of things. Number one, identify the current wealth landscape and challenges for wealthy families. Um, and number two, learn about family wealth education and how to introduce that curriculum into your practice. John's a perfect person to do this. He has 36 years of investment and financial services expertise. He's worked prior to joining PIMCO. He's with Nuveen Investments. And before that, he was vice president um, with the Merrill Lynch Private Client Group. He's also a faculty member for the Investment and Wealth Institute's education programs, which are held at Yale University and the University of Chicago. So throughout the presentation, we will accept questions. Um, we're happy to answer them. We've left plenty of time. So to do so, simply put them in the Q&A box here um, on your screen, where, however you have your screen set up, and um, we'll make sure to get to those. Okay, so John, I'm going to let you take it away. Oh, thanks so much, Teresa. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, work with my friends at Hightower. And I have a lot of friends at Hightower. I don't really consider it to be a business relationship. It's good people and Folks I've known for so many years, my buddy Greg Sarian down in Philadelphia and Todd Lyon out in California and David Bonson and right here in Naples, Florida, my friends, uh, Mark Masterson and David Emma, there's some really, really talented folks uh, that are part of that high tower umbrella. And I do want to thank you for providing me the opportunity to speak with your clients and uh, those that you partner with, including the very talented CPAs who are on the line with us today. Hey, listen, I get it. At the end of the day, as a financial advisor, the primary focus is delivering investment guidance to a client, maybe as a, as a tax accountant or CPA. We're very focused on the tactical issues that our clients need help with. How do I take advantage of the 199A deduction for pass-through entities to ensure that they retain the 20% deduction without exceeding the AGI limits? How do we help the corporate executive take advantage of those equity awards that they've received? They're, uh, incentive stock options where they might utilize a qualifying disposition or the restricted stock units where they might take advantage of the 83B election. I get it. That's a lot of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. But as Teresa alluded to, at some point in the client relationship, some point in their experience, the focus will change. And it will no longer be about helping me allocate capital intelligently to achieve a certain rate of return. It will no longer be primarily focused on how do I save every available dollar from a tax perspective. At some point in our client's life, and I don't know if it occurs at a certain age, when the client reaches the age of 50 or 60 or 70, I don't know if it's a net worth level, when that client achieves a number of 10 or 25 or 100, at some point, their objective will change. And their primary concern will no longer be about increasing returns or minimizing taxes. It'll, about, it'll be about leaving a legacy behind. Hey, look, I'm a high tower client and I'm 63 years old. I know my son 10 makes me look younger. And, and I promise you at this stage in my life, what keeps me awake at night, my primary concerns, I certainly want great investment returns and I wanna take advantage of every available tax planning or saving opportunity. But my primary concern, my primary objective at this stage in my life is making sure that I leave an appropriate legacy behind to support my wife, to support my lovely daughter, Margo, to support my son, Daniel. It's not about just transferring money. It's about transferring values. It's about transferring opportunities. It's about transferring stewardship. And I hope that each and every one of you, not instead of the great capabilities that you're bringing to bear currently, 
I hope maybe in addition to all those other great capabilities that you've begun to ask the right questions. You've begun to identify the pain points for many of our clients. I'll bet many of you have seen it. That really successful family, the entrepreneur who built this business from scratch and then wound up monetizing for a big number. I'll bet you've seen both examples. On the one hand, a successful family that took care of the capital and used it productively for their own needs and to support the causes of others. And then you've also seen the reverse. Other families that have enjoyed financial success, but where the money led to dissatisfaction, it led to disruption, it led to a lack of harmony. And so I'm going to introduce to you today, obviously we're not gonna accomplish a ton, but I'm gonna to introduce to you today, maybe the challenge that some of these wealthy families face and the opportunity before each and every one of you, because whether you know it or not, you, you sit in a very privileged position. Your clients love you and your clients trust you. I mean, they really do. You know, that relationship, I would imagine, extends well beyond just the tax planning that you might do for them or the financial planning that you might engage in. Your clients do have a lot of confidence in you, a lot of credibility, a lot of trust. And, and so you can play a really meaningful role in helping them facilitate progress in this particular area. So with that as background, let's kind of jump in. I love this Buffett quote. And, and I bet you get this question often. I know that I did when I was advising clients directly, and I still do today as an industry teacher or educator. What's the right number? I've been successful. I've accumulated some wealth. How much should I leave my kid? And I bet you get very divergent answers from the client. Some clients say, look, my goal is to leave my kids as much as I can. Right? I've worked really hard for it. The money's important. I'm proud of my success. I want to provide my children with the privilege of it. And other families respond very differently, saying, wait a minute. I made this money myself. The last thing I want to do is turn it over to my kids. In fact, I think I'd be depriving them with an opportunity to establish their own identity, to create wealth and success that they've earned on their own. And so this Buffett quote very much speaks to that issue. Here are the things we'll be talking about. We'll take a look at the challenge for wealthy families. We'll identify, if you will, some of the opportunities to introduce this, not for every client that you work with. If there are 100 families that you're serving, I can almost guarantee you that 90% of them won't be interested in or ready to embrace this subject. But for that 10 or 20% that are, they need your help. They don't know how to do this. They're concerned about the implications of significant wealth, and they would love to work with a partner like you who can provide some assistance in this journey because they haven't done it and they're concerned about making mistakes. We'll then identify some very um, appropriate best practices as to how some successful families have embraced the opportunity. Look, not every family does. I'll tell you a quick little personal story. My dad came over from Syria at the age of 18. Uh, he was born and raised in Aleppo. And he was the first of his family to leave and come to the U.S. And, and so I don't know if it was a function of the time. I don't know if it was a function of his personal or specific background. But when, growing up, we never talked about money. In, in fact, we were often told that it was inappropriate to talk about money. And while I certainly would never disagree with a family's personal perspective on it, I think there was a missed opportunity. Communication is so important. Communication and education about what money is about, about what it means in our lives, about our responsibilities to steward the capital that we've accumulated and to use it productively for our own needs and maybe for society at large. That communication issue is something that many, par many parents and every, many families struggle with. We'll give you some best practices as to how to facilitate that. Um, let's take a look at maybe the greatest challenges. And I bet you've heard this expression before, shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations. It's maybe not so challenging to create wealth, but once you've created it, how do you, how do you maintain it? How do you avoid the natural destruction of wealth? Because there are so many outsized influences that have a destructive impact on family wealth. Only 70% of it makes it to G2. And then finally, G3, you're lucky if you get 10% of the capital there. I'll give you an illustration as to why that happened. But before I do, I'll tell you a quick story. I, I was embraced by a family. Um, I, I do a lot of work with this particular advisor out in Arizona. A anybody been to Sedona, Arizona? Be beautiful topography out there, right? Those striated mountain formations of multiple colors. And so this family, and if I told you the name, you'd recognize them. They are 
The family created their wealth in St. Louis. So you might offer a guess as to who this family was. So I got a call from the advisor serving the family saying, hey, John, this family's worth about 400 million and um, they could use your help. And I said, great. <laughs> what is it you want my help with? Do you want me to help them write an investment policy statement? Do you want me to help them with some tax planning issues? Or, you know, is it succession? What, what's the deal? And they said, none of the above. This family, uh, this is G2. These are adult children, 70 years old. They've got children of their own who are in their 40s and 50s who are about to receive inheritances of $400 million through trust vehicles. The family's concerned that they've never told the kids about the money. There's never been a discussion about the money. There's never been any expectations set regarding the responsibilities of the capital. So the question was, is how can we begin to make progress in this effort? We held a family meeting. We engaged in family values. We talked about responsibilities. And then we began to implement a financial literacy program for this family. I'm not sure that we've solved all their issues. After all, there was a lot of baggage they brought to the table. I mean, these kids, some good news and some bad news, some very successful family outcomes, but unfortunately, some very personal issues there as well. DUIs and failed marriages and interfamily lawsuits. And I'll bet you've seen examples of this, hopefully not too many. But these are the challenges that many families face, and maybe that's why they need our help in this endeavor. You can see why the wealth gets dissipated, right? And, and so the original creator of the wealth uh, assumes that the money's going to last forever. Well, hold on a sec. I've got the money. I'm earning a positive return. But now all of a sudden, I've got some destructive forces at play. I've got inflation. I've got conspicuous consumption. As, as my lifestyle expenses <laughs> continue to escalate, maybe at a rate faster than my investment return. I've got administrative fees. I've got estate taxes. I know the estate tax exemption today is $12 million per person. That's 24 million bucks for a married couple. But for families of significant wealth of 50 or 100 or a billion or more, you know that $24 million exemption may or may not be sufficient at preserving the wealth. So you can see how through spending, through taxes, through the division of the original corpus, how wealth can become dissipated rather quickly. Here's a question for all of you to think about. What is the right distribution rate? So if I've got a corpus, and if my goal is to not just provide me with the income I need during my 20 or 30 year retirement experience, but to maybe have this last, to have it endure for multiple generations, what's that number? Is it 4%, which Guyton and Bengen have often wrote, written about? I've written a couple of articles on appropriate distribution and sequence of returns risk and how you avoid the negative destruction of uh, volatile market environments and drawdown. I mean, I get that tactical issue, but how do families figure out what the appropriate amount is to spend? Because think about it. There are two divergent goals that are at play simultaneously. On the one hand, I want to make sure that the money lasts as long as it possibly can. That's goal number one. But goal number two is I want to maximize my standard of living while I'm still here. And I'm sure that all of you recognize that those two simultaneous or concurrent goals are in direct opposition to each other. And so how do we help families solve for that? Have you helped them develop a distribution policy that is sensible, that is logical, that is disciplined? to provide some comfort towards the attainment of those two very important objectives. What is it we want to pass on? All right, we want to pass on money. But it's interesting to note when we survey wealthy families, this is from the Wall Street Journal, what's just as important as passing on the money is passing on our values, passing on our life lessons, instructions on how we want this money to be managed both today and in the future. These are important concerns for many wealthy families. And the challenge is, is that, uh, Many of our kids don't get it. You know, they really don't. I don't know if you work with families today who are faced with this issue. John, my kids are asking me for money. And so the question is, is when should I support them and when shouldn't I? My kids, Marco, <laughs> had a flat tire on Gary, her Audi Q3. Two, and the, one of the tires had a bubble in the sidewall. And so it was 800 bucks to buy some new tires. And the question that my wife and I discussed is, are we helping the kids by providing financial support? I'll bet you get this often. My kids need money for a new home purchase. My kids need money for a vacation. My kids need money for a new business venture. 
many parents are challenged with that. On the one hand, we want to be supportive. On the other hand, we don't want to enable our children. We want to give them responsibility so they eventually develop a sense of independence themselves. We've got a policy in our family, and I know that many others have embraced or adopted it. You can pick the one that works for you. Set some boundaries as parents as to what kind of financial support you will provide your kids. I don't know if it's a dollar figure. I don't know if the support is available up to a certain age and then not after. Or maybe it's terms regarding financial support. One family that I work with very closely said, John, we will support our kids financially for one of three very important objectives. No questions asked. Number one, top of the list, education. We were so fortunate to have an educational opportunity. We want to make sure that we provide that for our children and for our grandchildren. No questions asked, educational opportunity. Number two, we will support our kids for anything regarding their health. If there's a medical issue that needs to be attended, even down to linking our kids' Uber accounts to our credit cards, we want to make sure that our children are always making safe decisions regarding their personal well-being. And then third is philanthropy. We want to teach our children that there's an important value that is close to us and that we hope they adopt as well, which is their goal in this world, their job, is not just to take care of their own selfish needs. It's to make sure that they are parts of a larger community, part of a global community. And the joy and the satisfaction that comes with sharing that wealth with others. And so that's something that we definitely want to embrace, something we definitely want to set an example of, something that we definitely want to instill in our children as well. Take a look at some of the lessons that we need to teach our kids. <laughs> Did you know that 85% of parents said, I don't have to worry about this because my children are being educated about money in the school system. I'm not sure that that's happening. Now, there's good news that there is progress being made on that front. And I know because I'm directly involved in some of the programs. I launched a wealth pro uh, management program down at UT Austin and been involved in some of these educational curriculums. And so the good news is, as a society, uh, instead of just studying history and mathematics and science, personal finance is making its way into both the elementary, high school, and college curriculums. And so maybe, I mean, gosh, can you think of a more important course to take than personal finance when the kids are in those formative ages? A couple of important lessons that the kids need to learn. Number one, how to earn money. Because financial security, however you define it, it, it doesn't come for free. You've got to work hard to earn money. Number two is after you earn it, we know people who earn it and spend it just as quickly. We've got to teach our kids how to save it, right? How to be good savers come up with a savings policy. Number third, three, how to spend it wisely, how to make intelligent choices regarding the expenditure of capital. Third, uh, fourth on the list, we need to teach them how to invest, right? And I know that you all partner with really great advisors at Hightower and that you personally have some skill in this area as well. And so we need to teach our kids or the kids of our parents, uh, of our clients, how to uh, invest wisely. And then finally, we need to te teach them how to share that philanthropy is an important expectation. And unfortunately, these lessons aren't necessarily being taught universally. Hey, let me give you a couple of really good books. Jot these down where you can begin this facilitation. Really good book that I just finished, Kids, Wealth, and Consequences, written by Richard Morris out of Chicago. Second book, written by my friend, Ron Lieber. He writes for the Sunday New York Times business section, that um, Your Money column. Ron wrote a really good book, very pedestrian, but very readable, called The Opposite of Spoiled. Not an interesting title. Third book, Wealth in Families, written by Charles Collier from Harvard University. These are three really good books. And you know what I would suggest to those of you who are interested in this subject? Maybe you buy the book and you read it. And then maybe after you've done so, maybe you send it to one of your clients. Hey, Jim, I just finished reading this great book. And I couldn't help but when reading chapter three about, I don't know, teenagers and allowances, I couldn't help but think about your relationship with your son, Timothy. I hope you find the read to be interesting. And I'd love to help you if this is an important subject that you'd like to make progress with. Your clients learn a couple of things. Number one, they learn that you're thinking about them and that you care about them. And boy, isn't that an important quality. And number two, 
your clients begin to realize that this is something that is a critical objective of theirs and that you can provide assistance around this capacity. Take a look at some of the challenges. Look at the disconnect, if you will, this next generation that we often refer to. And I think this next generation is great. They're courageous. I mean, they really are. They take risks that I would have never thought about taking when I was younger. But their values are a little bit different than maybe the values of their parents. Take a look at the bottom of the chart. 67% of the children of our clients are interested in enjoying life to its fullest today. Only 37% of parents identified that as a critical objective. 58% said, wait a minute, I want to make the world a better place. What, however they define it, however they may contribute to that progress, only 34% of parents said that that was a, an issue of theirs. 51% of these kids said, wait a minute, I want to support charity. It feels good. It feels right. Makes me feel valued. Makes me feel like I'm making a significant contribution to others. And so you can see this disconnect, if you will. And, and that's okay. That's okay. We're all going to come to the table with different perspectives. But the objective is dialogue. The objective is progress. The objective is finding commonality, common ground where we as a family unit can agree upon certain things that are priorities or important to us and then work on them together. Surprise, 14% <laughs> of people who inherit money said I had no idea it was coming. Remember that family I told you about out in Sedona, Arizona? 90% of families say we don't meet about, we don't meet to discuss money. And so something that we've adopted in our family and something that I think works for many is to just set a regular schedule, just like you'd have board meetings every quarter, just like you have team meetings at your job once a week or once a month. I don't know, maybe it's every six months or once a year, you get the family together to talk about money, but more importantly, to talk about concerns, to talk about priorities, to talk about responsibilities and expectations. And so we've developed a curriculum on how to hold and orchestrate a family meeting. I've done many of them. We'd be glad to partner with you in that. We'll go over some keys to success, some best practices around that concept of family meetings. We'll go over that a little bit later in our chat today. Here are the challenges. This comes directly from the family. They're worried about their kids and the impact of money. They're worried that their kids are not prepared to inherit money. I know that many of you are directly involved in establishing trusts. We did it down here in Naples, Florida. We went ahead and created our slats uh, last year when the estate tax number was up for debate. And one of the important decisions that we had to make was at what age or under what circumstances would the trust assets be distributed to the kids? All right, we don't want to handcuff them. We want to give them the opportunity to learn and to establish independence. But for every family, that decision's a little bit different. Sometimes it's a function of age. Sometimes it's determined by other characteristics. They're worried that their children are not prepared to handle the financial responsibility of managing money and the emotional consequences of it. They're worried that money received will have a negative impact on the kids. I'll bet you've seen it. If you live up in Winneka, I bet you've seen it. Your neighbors, some of them are very grounded, but haven't we all seen, depending on what marketplace you live in, that money can have a negative consequence on those who have received wealth. Sometimes, unfortunately, it leads to a sense of entitlement, a lack of motivation, the perspective of materialism, arrogance. And that's certainly not what we want our money to accomplish in our family lives. They're worried that the kids are going to squander the wealth. They're worried about the conflicts that may occur within the family. But you've seen it. Families that had traditionally gotten along so well, all of a sudden, there's a question, a decision to be made about maybe managing the parents' capital or about distributions from, the, from a death. And now all of a sudden, relationships that were so harmonious all of a sudden become fractured. And so we want to make sure that we take whatever steps are required to prevent that from occurring. Here's the challenge for many wealthy families. Our kids have a number of choices that they need to make. Some choices are financial right? How to invest money, how to spend money, who to give it to, et cetera. Some of them are intellectual. What role will money play in our lives? How do we identify goals in our life in terms of who we want to be and what we want to accomplish? 
both financially and in other aspects. And then finally, some choices are spiritual and emotional, where we would love to see our children make the right choices so they eventually acquire the qualities that we think are important or admirable, independence, gratitude, confidence. This family wealth curriculum can help us get there. And so here are the objectives that many families have. We want to teach our kids how to manage wealth. We want to encourage them to be entrepreneurs, to be able to uh, invest in businesses, to be creative, to have the courage to take risks, sensible risks, with business plans, with thought, with hard work, to accomplish something meaningful in this world. We certainly want to help them become independent and to not necessarily be tethered to the parents for support throughout their lives. We want to teach them the importance of philanthropy and the idea that money is a social responsibility. We want to make sure that our children develop a sense of humility, regardless of the financial success that they may enjoy. And so here's a great way to start the conversation. I've got some resources that I'd be glad to send you. Here's some questions that maybe help you identify the families for which this conversation is relevant. And to begin to understand your clients beyond their marginal tax brackets and their net worth figures. How do you define success? How did you achieve it personally? Tell me about your expectations for your kids. What does money mean to you? How do your children view your success and the wealth that you've accumulated? Tell me about your kids and their skill set. Are they prepared financially to manage wealth intelligently? Are they prepared emotionally for that responsibility as well? Some of these questions can be very helpful in facilitating that conversation, bringing awareness to the issue, and then hopefully making some progress on that front. Now, here are some of the responses that you may get. Be prepared. <laughs> John, I've heard this one often. John, I get it. It's a concern, but I'm not doing this. I am not opening the books. Thinking of that movie. What was the movie with Joe Pesci? We're opening the books to you. I don't want to open the books to my kids. Don't want to show them all the money. Now, I, I understand that concern, and each family's got their different view on that. But, but please understand that the objective here is different than the one I just articulated. The goal is not necessarily to share every aspect of financial circumstance with the kids. The goal is to facilitate a conversation around the responsibility and expectations of the money without necessarily sharing dollar figures. How about this one, John? I've missed the opportunity. My kids are older. Well, I'm not sure that this objective ever ends. We certainly want to start when the children are younger, maybe help them develop some good money skills when they're of school age. But we've seen children make mistakes. We've seen children who could use some assistance and some education as they continue to grow, as they eventually create families of their own. How about this one? John, I don't have the time or expertise. I don't know how to do it. Well, that's exactly how you might enlist some outside support, whether it's us or your great advisors at Hightower, or maybe even the role that you might play in this particular endeavor. I get it. You're not directly paid to do it. I, I will tell you as a client, if you can help me on this issue, that capability is as important as any other that you might provide me with. Another response that you often hear, John, I made this on my own. Came here with nothing in my pocket. I built it myself. I don't want to leave my children with anything. Let them achieve their own success. I get it. But eventually, money is going to flow somewhere, and there's this intellectual choice that needs to be made. Am I going to spend it all myself? I don't know how that works. Am I going to leave it behind for the government and let them decide how that capital gets dispersed or allocated? Am I going to leave it to charity? And if so, what charities do I want to support? And in what capacity do I want to use it to retain it within my family? to see some productive things that my family can accomplish with a little bit of a financial head start. These are the kinds of the decisions that many of our families are facing. So let's talk about some of the things that we can begin to uh, utilize as best practices to make progress on this very important issue. We've identified five, uh, but I'm sure that all of you have other experiences as well that maybe you're willing to share with us when we get to the Q&A section. I don't know if there will be a ton of questions on this subject, but gosh, I would love to hear from you some of the experiences that you've all enjoyed or endured. Um, 
some success stories that some families have enjoyed. Uh, maybe some not so successful outcomes of families that didn't necessarily um, adopt some of these best practices and paid the consequences. Uh, I'd love to hear from you if you're willing to share those. So the first thing that I'd like to talk about is some of the best practices that are important to the families that are ready to receive this information. Here are some of the best practices to establish family continuity, shared values. One of my favorite exercises is to get the family together. And I get it, they're all different. Mom and dad are different and the three kids are different. So this idea that we will be homogeneous, that we will be consistent in our views. We've got liberals and conservatives. We've got older, we've got younger. I get it, there are going to be differences, but the objective here is to find common values. And so one of the exercises that we engage a family with is to actually uh, pass out what we call values cards, various values that every member gets. And then we ask them to rank these values in terms of their importance. And our objective there is not to create conflict or disagreement, but to find commonality of things that are shared, values that are shared, objectives that are shared of the different family members to talk about their relative importance, talk about why they are important, talk about a plan in terms of how they will be accomplished and to begin to implement. We want to establish boundaries regarding wealth and what the expectations are. We want to support family members. We want to prepare heirs to manage this wealth that will eventually come back to them. We want to promote stewardship and the idea that they should be thinking about giving back. All right, so here are some values. You pick the ones that you like. I've got some negative ones on the left and some positive ones on the right. You tell me which ones are important to you and which ones are not. We'd love to raise children when they're appreciative as opposed to those that feel entitled. We'd love to raise children who realize that their value in this world is not solely determined based on the job that they've achieved or the net worth that they've accumulated, that there's more to life than just maximum financial success. We'd love to all raise children that are independent that are not continu continuously tethered to mom and dad, but develop the skills required to become independent, to become self-sufficient. We want children that are gonna be productive. They're gonna add value to society, to add value to their communities, to add value to the businesses that they're involved with, as opposed to those that might be unmotivated because they've inherited or received significant wealth. Take a look at this slide. I know what you're thinking. <laughs> it shows you the strength of my PowerPoint skills. Take a look at the, um, the image on the left-hand side. Uh, take a guess. What do you think that's an image of? The most common answer I get is, John, that's a computer monitor, isn't it? Well, that's not what I was intending to draw. That image on the left is an 85-inch Samsung 4K ultra high-def TV. It's an OLED, by the way. And the reason that I drew this image or tried to project that image was because we have one, it's in our basement. And, and so I wanna tell you a quick little story about how this particular uh, uh, item came to play an important role in sharing lessons and values with my son. And so my son was uh, at, at University of Dayton undergraduate and then went to Northwestern for a graduate program. And uh, when he was there, he uh, called one day, he said, hey dad, we've made the decision to move out of our dorms. We're gonna rent an apartment together, me and my six, six of my buddies. And he said, dad, I need that 85 inch Samsung ultra high def 4K OLED TV. We need that for our new apartment. Isn't that an interesting request? And so here are the lessons that I tried to impart upon my son uh, based on this experience. Lesson number one is how to hear no. And that was of course my answer. Could I have given him the TV or bought him a TV of similar size? I could have. I'm not sure I would have been doing him any favors. So lesson number one is children need to learn how to hear no. So often parents, to stop the negotiating or discussion, they just give in and they provide their kids with anything asked. I'm not sure that we're doing them any favors. Lesson number two in this example, I used it as an opportunity to teach our son the difference between wants and needs. His original verbiage was what? Dad, we need that TV. Me and my six dorm buddies, my response was, no, you don't need the TV, you want it. And I think helping children understand the difference between wants and needs is an important lesson. Lesson number three is how to make trade-offs. 
we're not always going to get what we want. And sometimes we have to accept a lesser outcome. And so that's exactly what we imparted in this particular circumstance. We didn't give him the 85 inch TV. We had an extra smaller one in one of the guest bedrooms. And he borrowed that. He used it. That was, I think, more appropriate for him given his stage in life. The next lesson is delayed gratification. And so the lesson was, look, we're not gonna give you the larger TV that you're looking for. You're gonna make do with the one that we're gonna lend you now. But if you come home and work during the summer, mom and I will match dollar for dollar, every dollar that you're able to earn and save to help you get to this goal a little bit more quickly. But more importantly, what we were trying to do, trying to motivate them to pick a goal, to work hard for it, to save money for it and to eventually buy it or acquire it on his own. And I'd like to think that that was a good lesson and that he'll be more appreciative of what he was able to accomplish on his own. And then finally, the fifth lesson, all of this, by the way, is tied up in that book, Kids, Wealth and Consequences, is how to develop common sense because children will be, our kids will all be solicited, right? That's the world we live in. They will be presented with business opportunities. And boy, it would be really great for us to be able to impart upon our children some common sense financially so that they don't fall victim to offers that are not necessarily in their best interests. Let's talk about children and financial values and expectations. You've got to come up with your own policy. What is it that we're willing to support our children on? Well, these are some common responses. Education. Want to go to school? Mom and dad are here for you. Maybe it's 529 plans. Right? Maybe you've utilized 529 plans because you realize 529s provide a unique opportunity. Annual gift exclusion for 2022, I believe, has been raised to 16,000 bucks. 529 plans allow us to front load five years worth of annual gifts. So that's 80,000 from mom and it's 80,000 from dad. And we all know that if we have a unique opportunity to save and invest money in an account structure, that allows those earnings to grow and compound tax-free, that's a much better option than keeping the money in our own names and paying taxes along the way. And in fact, a lot of families have utilized 529 plans, not, not just for the traditional college expense. I get it. That's what they're often used for. How about this? For wealthier families, they're using 529 plans as a leveraged way to reduce estate tax values. Listen, I get it. The exemption amount today is $12 million. When I started in this industry in 1981, the number was, just shows you how old I am, 650,000. <laughs> so that was 1.3 million per family. It's 12 million, million and change today. That's 24 million per family. And many of your clients are probably thinking, I'm okay. I don't need to meet with my financial advisors. I don't need to meet with my tax preparers or my estate planning attorneys. I don't need to do it because the government has bailed me out. TCJA took that number up to 12 million bucks. Well, not so fast. I've got three questions to ask the client who's been seduced into a false sense of security. Question number one is, when do you think you're gonna die? Question number two is, how much do you think you'll have at the time of your demise? And then question number three is, the number's 12 million today. What do you think that number will be in the future? And of course, our clients can't answer accurately any one of those questions which I think demonstrates the need to take advantage of the opportunity before them today. Holding a family meeting can be really helpful. And here are some keys to success. If you're gonna to help to facilitate it or encourage your clients to do it, once again, we've got a guidebook that we've authored that we'd be glad to share with you to help facilitate that family meeting. Whether you choose to get involved directly or leave it up to the family to execute on their own, some best practices for those who haven't necessarily engaged it before. Number one is to make sure that you create an agenda and that every family member has the opportunity to contribute to the agenda. We do not want dad, hypothetically, running the show. It's not his game. It's a family meeting, not dad's meeting to dictate to others exactly how these issues will be decided upon. So let's make sure that we give everybody the opportunity to contribute to the agenda and the issues that are important to them. Number two is let's have somebody who facilitates the meeting. I use the term director. I think I like the term facilitator even better. And so maybe it's mom who runs it today and maybe it's son number one who runs it tomorrow. We had one of the grandchildren run our family meeting down in Naples last year. And it was kind of a cool experience for her to have the opportunity to participate in running a meeting at a younger age. Third, establish some rules of engagement. 
as an example, open discussion, active participation, mutual respect. Even though we may disagree on a subject, we will respect the fact that there are others who have a very valid point of view. And we can choose to disagree. We can choose to try to come up with an appropriate solution, but let's make sure that we do so in a respectful manner. We're gonna hold this meeting in a neutral location. I don't know, families are so fractured today. We all were very mobile. Maybe it winds up being held in a centralized location while we're on vacation in Hawaii. Maybe it winds up being held at our place of business. Maybe it winds up being held at our family um, compound or retreat where family members gather together. But maybe in some instances, it happens in a skybox at a stadium, or it happens at a restaurant in a back room, or it happens somewhere in a church hall after church services. But let's hold it in a neutral location to make sure there's objectivity. Make sure that we're taking notes and, and that we agree upon and disseminate, if you will, the decisions that have been made. Make sure that we pass out an action plan so that people realize that their time was actually productively used to come up with a list of action steps that will be executed upon. It wasn't just a conversation, it was a path to progress. Next, how about writing a family mission statement? And so I wanna ask you a question. I, I get it, we're all focused on the money. We're worried about what's going on in Ukraine. We're worried about the possibility of higher interest rates. We're worried about tax reform and what may or may not come of it if Build Back Better ever gets passed. I get it, that's important. Not. I'm not suggesting this instead of, I'm suggesting in addition to, but at the end of the day, how is it that we want our family to be remembered? What is it that we've contributed? Look, looking at a larger number on a balance sheet makes you feel good, but for many folks, it's not the ultimate objective. It's what did my success enable me to do? So I think I mentioned this a little bit earlier. I'm thinking about retiring, I'm 63. And uh, it's hard. It, it's so funny. I thought that retirement would be an easy issue for me, right? I write about retirement. <laughs> I teach it for a living. John, this should be a layup for you. Well, it's not. Re retirement involves a lot of issues. Some of them are financial, but some of them are not. And, and haven't you worked with a client who retired at age 60 and that client said, oh my gosh, this is great. I wish it did it five years sooner. I'm really enjoying that freedom and opportunity to spend my time in the way that I choose. And then other clients who retire at age 60, and they say, you know what, that was a mistake. I kind of missed the engagement. I missed the challenge, the responsibilities that I had when I was actively working. And so there is no singular answer for each and every one of them. So I think here are the four keys to success in that regard. Number one, finances. You've got to have the money, not just because you want to see more money in a bank account, but, but with money comes a sense of calm. If I know that through the help of my advisors and my tax accountants and other financial professionals, that, that I've achieved that number, I can relax and enjoy retirement instead of worrying about the financial implications of it. Number two, health. Health matters. Yeah. I've had some bad experiences recently. People who have just left us way too young. And, and doesn't that shake you up a little bit? and cause you to think about what's really important and how you're gonna spend your time. So health matters. Next on the list, family and friends. Who are you spending it with? And isn't those relationships that you have, isn't that ultimately what brings satisfaction and joy to your life? And then finally, last on the list, and this is the one that I really struggled with, is purpose. What is your purpose? Why are you here? I play golf with some knuckleheads down here in Naples. And um, they were teasing me the other day because I'm not always available. I'm busy. I work for a living. <laughs> and so they were giving me a hard time. Hey, how come you missed the game on Friday? I'm like, well, I was teaching five classes that day. And they were teasing me. What are you doing that for? And I said, guys, I said, I got to be honest with you. I enjoy our time together. And I do like playing golf. I'm a four handicap. But, um, but there's got to be a purpose. And that purpose isn't just spending my time playing golf or doing yoga or playing pickleball. There's got to be a purpose, something that I feel I'm accomplishing or contributing or offering to others. And so that's a challenge for many families. That can be defined in the family mission statement. What is the purpose of your family? 
And how do you want your family to be thought of or remembered? What are you contributing either to your family and or its members or to others that are important to you? Here are some questions that may help you in the facilitation of that. Define your family. If I asked you to define exactly how you want your family to be remembered, what are those qualities that are included in that statement? I don't know, they're probably different for everybody, but have you thought about it? I mean, the money comes and the money goes, but I mean, isn't there something else there that, that matters a a as much as the money does? A couple of examples of how that family mission statement can be crafted. Let's talk about philanthropy because I think this is such an important issue when it comes to family wealth, not just once again, accumulating more for us and not just teaching our children how to manage it, but this whole premise of philanthropy. How about constructive capitalism? The idea that we want to be active investors. We want to see capital grow. We have a responsibility with money to use it productively, but also then to share it or to have that capital serve a greater purpose than our own consumption. And so questions we ask all the time is, are you giving money? Not, not to encourage you to give more money away, but to be intentional in the giving that you're doing. I hope each and every one of you have at a minimum a donor advised fund. Did you know that there was $470 billion given to charity last year? 470. It was the largest number on record. And we probably know why, right? Markets have been really productive. Real estate values are going up and Clients have all these unrealized gains in their portfolio. And so money is being given, but I'm willing to bet that you've seen many examples of charitable giving that was done ineffectively. The client who went to some fundraiser down at Navy, Navy Pier and then wrote a check at the end of the night. And while we might applaud their generosity, we would probably disagree with the methodology. So we want to encourage clients to be thoughtful about their charitable donations. Do you know what the standard deduction this year? It's 25.9. I know itemized under Schedule A. I get 10 for state and local taxes. But then the next $15,000 of itemized deductions essentially provide no benefit. I'm already getting it under the 25.9. 85% of taxpayers today, maybe not our clients, but 85% of them are claiming the standard number. And so the question I'm asking is, look, if I'm going to give 10,000 bucks a year to St. James Armenian Church in Evanston, over the next 25 years, that's $250,000. Am I better off parsing out checks each and every year, not knowing the associated tax benefits? Or am I better off maybe funding a donor advised fund with a larger lump sum amount, bunching my deductions, to use that terminology, in a single calendar year to liquidate the asset and avoid the capital gain? to avoid the net uh, NII, the ACA tax of 3.8% for families above 250, to have the money grow tax-free, and then to engage my children in the process of identifying the charities that we want to support, that we will make distributions from. That's intentional philanthropy. And can it be very, listen, um, uh, we often try to teach children by telling them lessons. Right? We want you to save well. We want you to share your success with others. And sometimes, not often, children listen to what we tell them. You know what really shapes a child's behavior? Are their observations of yours as a parent. Children replicate what they see from us more than they embrace what we tell them. And so let's make sure that we provide positive examples for these kids by demonstrating the values that we think are important and the values that we want them to adopt as well. Let's talk about some things that you can do to begin to build financial literacy, particularly for younger kids. I've got a whole curriculum that we'd be glad to share with you. One of the first ones early, at an early age is allowances. How much do we give our kids for allowance? What are the expectations as to what you buy and what mom and dad will buy? Let's clarify that so that there's no ongoing disagreement. And then when it comes to the allowance, we want you to think about how you're allocating it. Here's a, the three jar example that you're probably familiar with. One third of the money that I give you, it's your own spending. And I know as parents, we would love to tell our children how to spend their money to help them avoid what we think are mistakes. Don't do it. Let them make mistakes because kids learn a heck of a lot more from the mistakes they make than they do from the lessons that we teach. Let them 
take responsibility for their own choices. Jar number two is savings. Now, to ask a younger child to put money into a black hole and to save it for some abstract goal, it may not be effective. So maybe sit down with the kids, the five-year-old, the 15-year-old, the 25-year-old. What are you saving for? Is it a bicycle? Is it a new laptop? Is it a home? Is it a car? Identify what they're saving for. Show them how much needs to be saved at a certain rate of return. Because if you clarify that path and help me see the end game that I'm saving toward, I'm much more likely to stay the course. And then third, it's the donation jar to make sure that kids understand their responsibility that some of this has to go to support the needs of others. Here's another great example. I know all of you take family vacations and I'm willing to bet that in many families, that responsibility of planning the family vacation falls on either mom or dad, right? And so here's an idea. Maybe when the children are of an appropriate age, I don't know, maybe they're 17 years old or 15 years old, we change the dynamic. We say, kids, mom and dad are not planning the vacation this year. This year, the vacation is on you. And you're going to do the research. And you're going to figure out where we're going to give you a set dollar number. You're going to decide where we're going to go. Are we going to go to Bermuda? Are we going to go to Hawaii? We're going to go to, um, you know, to Europe. You're going to figure out, are we flying first class? Are we flying coach? You're going to budget. Are we eating at a fancy restaurant? Or are we eating at McDonald's? You're going to decide. Are we staying at a Four Seasons or are we staying at a Holiday Inn Express? A couple of really important lessons that children learn from this experience. The first lesson they learn is number one, is vacations take a lot of work. I'll bet you that so many kids go on vacation not realizing uh, how much effort goes into planning one. They just come along with their suitcase or their backpack and they just have fun. Let's make sure that children are appreciative of the effort required. Number two, a lot of children have no idea how expensive a vacation is. It's not to make them feel guilty, but to help them understand that these privileges come at a cost. Third, they learn how to budget. They learn how to make decisions and choices as to how to apportion that fixed budget that you provided them with. We've provided you with a couple of other examples of some family activities as well. Some activities that, if you will, establish family uh, relationships, that establish family activities or remembrances. Maybe it's a trip that you take together. Maybe it's an activity that you engage in together. Uh, in our, at our family, we went ahead and took an art class together down in Naples. Uh, none of us are artists, by the way, especially me. I'm terrible. <laughs> I'm somewhat colorblind. I don't know the difference between green and blue. And, and so we did this together as a family and 16 of us, mom and dad and the kids and the spouses and the grandkids. And we use it as an opportunity after the family meeting to engage, embrace in an activity together, you know, to kind of learn, but more importantly, to have fun and some bonding experience. And uh, I'll, I will tell you that we probably got more paint on each other than we did on the actual canvas. But if you come down to Naples, Florida someday, and I hope you do, I hope you give me a call. If you come to Naples, Florida someday, and you walk into mom and dad's uh, uh, home down here on that front foyer, on that wall, what will you find? 16 paintings of the Naples sunset. None of them are particularly good, but an example and a remembrance of the time that we spend together, because that's ultimately what it's about. Hey, Teresa, Natalie, I want to thank you guys for the opportunity to be with you. I hope the conversation was instructive and thought provoking and just want to thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. It was wonderful. And the whole TV analogy, we've got that going on here. So did I it totally like understand it. Did it look like a computer monitor to you? I think I think that's what it was. A computer it totally monitor. did. But you start to feel like, but you are watching a TV right now and it seems to work. Hey, we have a question that came in. Do you mind? Um, no, oh, I got it was a compliment. Excellent oh. presentation. Thank you so much. So this was really great. And I love the practical tips along with the um, emotional stuff that we all need to think about. So tomorrow, everyone, so thank you, John. Thank you, Pimco, for providing this. Tomorrow, you're gonna, or maybe this afternoon or tomorrow, you will receive an email. And on there, it's going to have a link. So if you are watching this to get CPA CE credit, we'll be able to provide that to you utilizing that link. 
Um, and if you have any other questions um, or anything else that you would like from us, just feel free to reach out to me or to Natalie Wheeler, and we're happy to get that for you. So thanks, John. Appreciate you. Thanks so much. Happy thanks to Thanks all of you for attending. Bye-bye.